I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pleased now to, uh, to introduce this next uh, session. It was in, inspired by the, uh, by the recently published uh, book of the same name, uh, Equity Holders Under Siege, Strategies and Tactics for Distressed Businesses, which was written by Mr. Peter Kaufman here to my right and, uh, and Henry Owsley, their, their second tome. And I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are more to come. And, and with the support of Laura Keller from Bloomberg, we're going to dive deeply into, uh, into uh, the equity community and, and talk about uh, challenges, opportunities, and uh, what you've learned and, and what we need to know going forward. Peter? Good morning. I'm going to do a quick hit here. On my left, Laura Keller. Next to her, Brian Gard, partner at Berger Singerman and one of the leading uh, insolvency lawyers in the country. Next to him is my, my cohort running mate, uh, Henry Owsley, who, along with me and our firm, are the sole defenders of old equity in this world. Uh, now, next, do you know who the best bankruptcy judge in the country is? He's here this morning. It's whoever I'm introducing at the time. So, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have uh, Judge Carey, who, for you Latin scholars, I, I view as primus inter pares among the bankruptcy uh, judges in this country. And last but not least, from the uh, control private equity side, John Capel of Comvest. So I hope we have a, a great panel. And uh, Laura, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, thanks. I'm so glad you did the introduction. I was going to have to have given a very long lead in for all these fine gentlemen up here. So, welcome, you guys. Um, I'd love to just kind of delve right into it. You know, we have a lot to talk about. Um, so the first thing, maybe we could talk about the premise of this panel, which I think, you know, for a lot of people sort of appends the view that creditors who lent money get paid before the equity holders, above and, be above and beyond anything else. Um, so maybe if we could sort of talk about, you know, those issues just right off the bat, just really quickly, and maybe, um, Henry, since you wrote the book, you might want to start with that. Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, many of you are fans of the absolute priority rule. Um, we are not necessarily and are not actually firm adherents to that. Um, just because today a company's value may stop in the middle of some debt class doesn't necessarily mean that people below that level don't deserve anything. Uh, we firmly believe that uh, lower constituencies, and particularly those of the equity stripe, have option value as things can improve down the road, they have control value, at least uh, initially and certainly in an out-of-court setting. And those factors uh, enable old equity constituencies to claw for meaningful recoveries. And one of the things our firm is all about is assisting old equity uh, constituencies in achieving that. And today, certainly in the private equity world, uh, the ability to uh, garner uh, incremental portfolio return uh, through focus on your underperformers can be the difference in a competitive fundraising environment between raising your next fund and not. So that's the difference between being in business as a PE firm and uh, retiring to the beach. So with that, that's what we are all about. Okay. Anyone else want to just comment on that briefly at all or on that topic? You know, is, is the guy that often uh, is in the seat deciding, you know, when we're going to fight and how hard we're going to fight. I think there's actually a whole series of things that go into it. How far out of the money are you? I mean, at the end of the day, if we're going to really go to war over five cents, five cents and zero are sort of the same thing to me, and they aren't going to impact whether I raise my next fund. I got to think about how hard I'm going to have to work. You know, once again, if I'm going to have to spend the next two years of my life fighting for mm -hmm. five cents, I can make more money other places. I'm going to go do it. I really have to think about who I'm fighting against. So particularly in the lower middle market, you still have a lot of cases where they're your relig original relationship lenders are in your deal. And you have to decide whether you're going to go to war on those guys, and you got to know how many other deals they're in. And is this going to impact not just this company, but other companies uh, on whether we're going to go forward. And so I think it's a bunch, of, a bunch of those things. You also have to decide what you want to fight for. So you can fight for value or you can fight for time. And you can kind of fight for both, but it helps if you know which one you want to fight for. And oftentimes in private equity land, it's actually more important to fight for time. 
because at the end of the day, once again, if I'm fairly washed, you know, as long as I'm not in bankruptcy and I still own the equity, I can make all sorts of arguments about what that might be worth. And my LPs sort of sit there and go, oh, well, that's a troubled one, but they're working hard at it. Once I have to take that zero or five cents, well, then I've gotten marked down, then I have a real problem. So oftentimes, ICP funds fighting for time, and then sometimes that means there's just not a lot of value left by the time you're at the end of that, so. Well, in advance of uh, this panel, Peter and Henry did send me their book, which, I don't know, you may come to regret later. <laughs> <laughs> because in it, you reveal a number of the strategies you employ mm -hmm. on behalf of equity. It reminded me of the line from the movie Patton, after Patton wins a battle that was planned by Rommel, and he says, Rommel, you magnificent bastard, I read your book. So I read your book. <laughs> well, you have me at another disadvantage. Uh, for the benefit of this audience, uh, I made the mistake of not turning my cell phone off uh, in your courtroom once. <laughs> and not once, but twice, Peter Kaufman called to try to get me on an emergency basis. And I was frantically trying to turn it off. And it didn't work. And so Judge Carey went like that. So I had to crawl up to the front of his courtroom and surrender my phone. I made you take the walk of shame. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, I got the book, too. Uh, Peter sent me the book, and I, I read it. Uh, I think I read it uh, while I was watching a Heat game, because the Heat games are not as uh, interesting as they once were. But uh, what I got from the book is uh, I don't think uh, I see old equity doing the same things they used to do in the last five to seven years. and uh, and. In, in light of the comments from John and, and Henry about where what old equity does these days, it, the, the landscape has changed uh, pretty dramatically. And let's talk about that too, right? I and mean, I've heard that theme come up a lot in some of these past distress conferences. What do you guys think has brought this change on? Is there something happening in the market? Is it particular with the PE firms themselves? What's, what's changing the aggression stance there? From my standpoint, from my perspective, what I'm seeing in my practice is so much of the the debt is trading before anything really gets going and anything happens that um, there's no relationship anymore for the sponsor who, who brought them into the deal. Um, they, uh, they're they out to extract their pound of flesh much earlier in the case, so John's comments about time are very, uh, you know, apropos. Um, so I just I just think there's, uh, the, the debt trading has just changed things dramatically as well. Maybe, John, yeah. if you could speak to that. Once a distress fund owns my debt, whole different ball game, right? And they're going to go out and assert their rights. Well, I'm going to assert mine too. And you just very quickly get to a much more contentious thing than a relationship lender who might give me some extra time, who might let me go down the path, and then we're going to all work it out together. You know, sort of once it's a once it's a distress fund, whole separate ball of wax. Yeah, one of the things we expound upon in the book is the importance of time. Uh, in the negotiating process because many distressed funds have target IRRs of 15, 20, 25 percent or even higher and by dint of waiting for time their IRR declines and so if you can cut a quick deal with them they may be willing to compromise on their principal recovery uh, in order to uh, facilitate a rapid uh, exit. So. Uh, the world is indeed changing, and it's an opportunity, quite frankly, uh, to think about how to take advantage of that. There's nothing wrong with buying debt at a discount. But what happens is when a distress, distressed debt investor buys debt, maybe in a number of different tranches, it's built a war chest, in essence, okay, by having bought at a discount. So it's got lots of money, doesn't necessarily want to take more time to fight the fight. And Although there are many loan-to-own players, certainly not all people who buy your debt are necessarily loan-to-own types, and they, many of them want to get some um, liquidity and move on to the next deal. Yeah, that's right, and it's important. They're very sophisticated, and most importantly, they didn't do the original deal. They didn't stand up in front of their committee and say, we should lend money to Fund X at $100. Cent. So, you know, they're, they're in this for a, for a deal, and so oftentimes there's a deal there to be struck. Heck, any more. By the time a company gets to bankruptcy, nobody who was there at the beginning is still there, including trade creditors. You know, you have a credit, an unsecured creditors committee that's filled with nobody who ever extended credit to the debtor initially. And, and including equity, interestingly enough, right? Oftentimes, you know, by the time a PE deal gets into bankruptcy, I hate to say it, that PE partner is fired. 
So, you know, oftentimes you have a very different person sitting in that chair. I actually would make an argument that, you know, one of your existing portfolio companies is in trouble. You are the world's greatest investor in that company. No one knows as much about it as you do. You have a huge advantage in the process over everyone else. All these PE funds should really be putting more money into their existing companies. The problem is, psychologically, it's almost impossible. This was a bad deal. Everyone on the firm is pissed off about it. You know, everyone has decided they hate this industry, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And so it's interesting to me, the psychology and the inability of old equity to put more money in, I think in PE, people should really look at it. It's a huge opportunity. Yeah, I wonder about the strategy sometimes in light of that, though, because uh, the sponsor comes to me and says, well, can, can I get my release? Uh, that's what we've been getting all these years. We've been getting, you know, doing the right thing, cleaning it up, leaving you know, cab fare for some of the constituents. And, uh, and maybe it costs uh, you know, a pound of flesh here or there, but get me my release, and no one's really concerned about giving them a release anymore. So uh, <laughs> I think that's very much a, a, a change in the, in the entire approach and strategy. Uh, so now it's about buying the release and what it takes to get the release. And if you haven't worked that out there, it's going to be much more litigation once, once you're in the proceeding. Can we just go back, though? Are we saying that the, the, on the part of the PE firms, they become more aggressive about whether you know, it's buying debt of their own companies at distress levels or doing some other structural action, that it's in response to aggressive distressed creditors? Is that what we're saying? I think, I think the, the distressed creditors allow you to do that and allow you to play these games. I also think you know, you just, there's enough examples of private equity guys being very aggressive and it working and doing some things that arguably were questionable uh, that it's shown the guys that are really smart that that's the right way to play the game. You know, act first and you know, ask for permission later. Yeah, and I it think works. I, I think we're seeing more of that. I think people uh, anticipate bankruptcies uh, a year or more out in advance and are taking certain structural um, steps to position themselves for that um, by moving assets around or even dividending them. It certainly sets you up for a fraudulent conveyance lawsuit, which is obviously more work for a lot of people in this room. It's sometimes the only asset available by the time you get to bankruptcy. And so it generates uh, litigation. And, but on the other hand, many people say, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. And they go ahead and do it and let the chips fall where they may. Um, some of us may think that's too aggressive, but it's it certainly is within the aggressive framework of what people do. Well, look, in today's world, over leverage, I guess, can occur one of, at least one of two ways. One is by design, uh, by moving things prior to the bankruptcy. The other way is simply by, you know, management borrowing too much and lenders lending too much. So by the time a company gets to that point where it hits the crisis stage, there's not much left to go around, and that almost always engenders fights zero-sum game with far less than the, uh, the, the appetite of the people around the table, we'll do that. Well, and maybe, I don't want to make this too much about Caesars, but you guys know that's been something I've covered for a while. So kind of thinking about these structural actions that were taken a little bit before. I know when we were talking on our, on our conference call before, we talked a little bit about this idea that you can anticipate things that might happen, maybe, um, John, you mentioned, pretty long into the future. And I'm wondering how we feel if, if Caesars, for example, what Apollo and TPG, the, the PE owners there, if what they did was a, a good way to kind of conduct this situation. I mean, obviously the fraudulent, um, potential fraudulent conveyance arguments are going to be an epicenter of the fights for the whole bankruptcy going forward. But do you think that they had, they put enough time between themselves and some of these actions? Is this a good form to follow? Anybody? Um. I think Apollo knew, uh, knew exactly what was going to happen and had decided well in advance as what they wanted to do. So they had the fourth. I'm not sure I want to go beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an active case right now, it and I think that um, l let's have a retrospective on that. <laughs> it's, uh, All it's, right. It's too early to tell how that will end. I mean, right. if, your, if your question is, did, did they plan? Yes, they, they planned. But, but, right, you have to recognize that PE firms that do distress and PE firms that do healthy deals are very, very different animals. So guys that do healthy deals don't understand this stuff. 
and they don't think about planning 24 months out, and they don't think about leaning up their dollars, and they don't think about all of this stuff until they get to the very end. Um, and, and then when they get to the very end, they don't really think like a distressed uh, negotiator, they think like an equity negotiator. Because they can't believe they got there. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they, you know, I'm not sure that's true. I think they act, I mean, look, I know when my deals aren't going well. This isn't confusing. And oftentimes I know when my deals aren't going well two, three years in advance. Um, it's so that what, I don't what do really. Do about, what do you do about it? Well, I don't do, uh, I, I do all sorts of things yeah. about it. But a lot of equity guys don't because they don't really do distress. And, and, you know, they've never really fought a contentious bankruptcy. They've never done any of these things, and they're not out there, you know, figuring out exactly what TPG and Apollo did and how I can do it or what Sun does, what a whole bunch of firms that have been very successful in this stuff do, right? They're in the business of going to conferences and finding out what the new hot area in logistics is, not in figuring out, you know, when my deals are kind of struggling, how do I maximize my return? But I think there's some real potential there. You know, my experience is with uh, private equity that has been through and, and focuses on distressed M&A and restructuring deals. They understand their responsibilities, their fiduciary duties as sponsor, but they also want to be ahead of the, the curve, so to speak, and, and, uh, and anticipate what the creditors are, are going to want when the time comes. And so they've got their people off the board early. They have found an independent uh, director to step in for them. They have uh, decided whether or not uh, they're going to be a buyer for the company again, uh, or whether they're going to work uh, with the creditors to transition it to the lender and let the creditors uh, be the new equity. They've, they've decided all those things. What's happening, and I think John commented on it, is that now their private equity is fighting more to retain uh, the asset and to provide some return to their fund investors, in which in the past, they were all about just getting the release. Now the, you know, the, the bondholders or the creditors are coming and said, we're not going to give you a release. In fact, we're going to examine the, the fees and whatever you took out in the last couple of years. And this is going to be you know, very much a proctology exam. So uh, they're way ahead of that now. So we're sort of seeing maybe the taint of restructuring, the, the sort of maybe taint of having your portfolio company land in bankruptcy or you being that aggressor maybe is going away a bit. Depends on who you are. If you're a distressed fund, then it's a lot easier, right? If you're, if you're a fund that's a go-go growth, I pay 12 times for everything guy, you don't want to have bankruptcy next to your name. Uh, on the other, and, and by the way, Oftentimes, those guys will do a lot of things and pay a lot to keep bankruptcy not next to their name, and you can extract real value from them. Oh, On the oh. other hand, if you're, if you're any one of a million guys that do tougher deals like, like Combest does and Sun and HAG and a bunch of guys down here, you know, our LPs understand that we're gonna play, we play a different game and it's a little tougher, and you know, they're gonna ask a question when one of our portfolio companies goes into bankruptcy, but oftentimes they recognize that it's part of a longer term strategy, and, that's what they hired me to do. Yeah, a lot of people have um, frequently sought what is known as a quiet burial, uh, which may be pursuant to the ABC proceedings in a given state. Um, but that, that too is changing. And actually, uh, I, I'm going to give a shout out to the entrepreneurs in this world, because this is not just about private equity. It's about um, entrepreneurs who founded their, their, their businesses, and they find themselves up against the wall. And i got to say um, that. The uh, ABI panel, uh, Jack Butler was talking about his passion for um, providing entrepreneurs with a, an exit here by sort of not imposing the absolute priority rule on them. I think that's a great step in the right direction. I, I personally hope that, that due to hopefully great experiences with that structure that the level is lifted from whatever cap it is. Uh, consider today because I think that's a great compromise uh, to uh, recognize that uh, old equity value has, you know, time value or other option value going forward. Well, what they've done is proposed a building into the statute of the um, new value corollary, um, which the Supreme Court has yet to say belongs with the bankruptcy code. So the court doesn't have to guess about whether that applies or not, if, if that proposal were ever enacted. You know, I just, I, and I, who knows how it's going to be enacted, but I, I think that the, the thought process that went into it is, should be applauded. So to our firm is a lender as well as an equity holder, 
And it strikes me as, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it strikes me as, a, when I was hearing about it, a bit wacky. I mean, when the entrepreneur ends up in bankruptcy, it's usually because he doesn't know how to run his company. And so when I go buy distressed companies, it's very rare that I buy the company and, wow, this management team that ran into the ditch, let's stick with them. So this whole concept that somehow entrepreneurs, because their family-owned businesses or what have you, are different, I, I just, I haven't seen a lot of cases where those guys drive their business into the ditch and then when given more time, everything is great. Would you apply the same logic though to management teams who maybe weren't the entrepreneur, weren't the founder, but were in there sort of for a while and maybe causing the problem? Well, there are a lot of reasons for business failure. One of which is a uh, individual drives the company into the ditch. Another reason is that there have been exogenous factors that cause it. Uh, another is that you know you just ran out of money in, and you're in between types of uh, funds who are interested in, in, in your kind of uh, situation. So this does provide a lifeline, certainly not a panacea. As you've heard, the ability of old equity to retain anything is controversial. And I have a certain religious view about which side of that I take. But I you know, I, you're right, sometimes companies are driven into bankruptcy by exogenous factors, but usually they weren't real, one, but real, well, real well run to begin with. I mean, the best companies in your industry that are well run find a way to work through the exogenous factors. Turns out if you're a business with exposure to oil, hey, maybe you should have hedged that. Maybe you should, you know, I, I, I very rarely see um, businesses with great management teams that are really being run well end up in, in distress. Now on the other hand, in almost every poorly run business, there's really good members of management that aren't, you know, that, that aren't uh, being given the right opportunities. So there's always diamonds in the rough you find in the business, but the concept that a, a business is gonna get in trouble and then it'll fix itself with no changes to management. And I'm right. sure it happens, I'm sure that everything happens eventually, but I just don't see it very often and I see the opposite a lot more often. I don't think the uh, I don't think it's all that controversial because I think most of the judges are finding a way to get to uh, exceptions on the new value rule anyway so what I what I see is uh, probably more controversial about the uh, the proposals of the ABI Commission is the uh, taking away uh, the the structure of a gifting plan or a gifting sale the recommendation was to uh, not allow the the SPM uh, manufacturing type of uh, gifting to lower classes by a lender or, um, uh, or as part of a sale and skipping classes and they're taking that, the, the ABI recommendation is to take that tool away. And for a lot of people in this room, that's how we get our deals done. So I think that's very controversial. Um, the other thing I think is very controversial is what they didn't touch in the business bankruptcy reforms, um, especially as it relates to um, treatment of professionals, uh, conflict situations, uh, and not, um, not trying to uh, legislate out the, uh, the J. Alex protocol for the, um, the uh, retention of CROs. So, the, so the, those are things they didn't touch, which those are things that need to be fixed. Well, you may still have some hope, at least with respect to the protocol. The U.S. Trustee's Office is now reviewing its position on that. And I don't get the sense that they're necessarily close to <laughs> proposing a change, but my impression is they're seriously considering it. But back to Henry's point, I have two cases now in which equity is keeping its interest or, or being paid for it. One of, one of the cases is, is a situation in which unsecureds are getting 100 cents on the dollar. Easy to say, hard to do. And the second one is a prepack. So maybe that's an effective way um, to have equity continue to play uh, by not having to get into bankruptcy and then deal with the absolute priority rule. Obviously, that assumes you have consensus with the other constituents. Well, it's a corollary to old equity does better generally if it's out of court than in court. And I view prepack as a formal implementation of an out of court solution. Um, the, uh, uh, the one thing that Brian mentioned was the word conflicts. Um, there's all sorts of conflicts that are rife in our business and 
if you are supposedly negotiating on behalf of the equity holders, you probably need to do so aggressively. And if you are representing uh, on other situations some of the uh, distressed debt players that John was mentioning before, you may have uh, find yourself in a difficult position um, in trying to both, uh, on one shoulder, um, carry water for the old equity, and on the other, have a hope of getting the next representation from the creditor client. So we see conflicts in this business as being particularly acute. <clears throat> If we could maybe just go back to, um, Henry, what you mentioned, and, and Judge Carey as well, and talk a little bit further through the decisions to be made on the in-court versus out-of-court from the private equity perspective. You know, when, when do we decide to try to do a prepack? Henry, I think that you said to me before, if a company goes into bankruptcy looking for a solution, they're toast. Well, it, it, it can be much more difficult to achieve a recovery. Uh, one of the significant factors that I think most of the people on this committee have said is that time can be old equities friend here. Once you enter into bankruptcy, there are a series of regimes that come into place, uh, one of which is uh, the exclusivity period, which has a time frame. It can be extended. But once you have that kind of date certain that's hanging out there like the Sword of Damocles, the ability to postpone things becomes a little less meaningful. So that is by way of one of the examples why out of court and early problem recognition is more important for old equity today than it may have ever been. You know, there's something that hasn't been mentioned, and that is Sometimes, as much faith as equity might have in its business, it overvalues the business, okay? So when I, for example, get a, a request for appointment of an equity committee in a case because the U.S. trustee has declined to, to form one, you know, when I hear the evidence, uh, you know, it's clear to me that despite the fact there may be great prospects in the future, and sometimes it's true, uh, but it's hard to value them, and it's hard to say whether their prospects can be become reality because that's prospects are just prospects. So I think that one thing that would be helpful to equity is that they they take a an objective, rational view of what the value really is. Now we have never appeared in front of you <laughs> doing something like that. I'm, I'm in not, fairness, just because I'm looking at you, Henry, <laughs> doesn't mean I'm suggesting that. And, and this is where you see a big difference between co uh, corporate owners and private equity. Private equity knows what their value is very, very clearly. Now, they may not, they may take a completely different approach in front of you. That's a separate issue, but oh, they know exactly where they are. Completely different situation with, with old equity in a, in a, in a family-owned business or an entrepreneur. They can be very in love with their businesses, but, but private equity knows where they sit. I mean, sometimes uh, existing equity or old equity has no choice. Uh, we were involved in a, a case where John's firm was very proactive in, in structuring a potential acquisition that would have been out of court, uh, I think the existing board um, had an unrealistic view of what the business was worth, ultimately realized on it in a much different way. But John's firm came in and told the board, this is what the business is worth, and, and you know we can, we can help you do it out of court. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, you know, old equity had to, in order to unlock the value, had to go into a proceeding. But, but for the having to unlock the value in the proceeding, the Convest plan would have been brilliant. But these things happen, and that's where the conflicts develop. Here's a prediction on uh, differences of opinion on equity value. Uh, Bill Wallander, I think, correctly said earlier that what you're going to see sooner rather than later in the uh, energy sector are service companies who are going to be the first uh, to really feel the pain here. The value of a service business is going to be depending on how much activity that someone's crystal ball is going to say that the business is going to generate you know, in three years. Well, no one is really going to be able to know that with any kind of precision. So there's going to be enormous debates as to value, and it's going to be all over the place. I think maybe we could expand upon that a bit. Maybe, Judge Carey, you could speak to this, valuation fights, right? Because a lot of this is 
pretty subjective. A lot of it is obviously projections. So how do you view the testimony about valuation um, in court? And then maybe we could also talk about methodologies a bit. Well, first I'll, I'll give you the overall picture. A valuation fight is never just a valuation fight. It starts at the beginning of the case with the party that's got a subordinated position that everyone says is out of the money objecting to everything. Okay. So that goes through the 11. And then if things aren't resolved before you get to confirmation, then you have the valuation fight. But it's been preceded by many battles along the way. Uh, of course, we all recognize, and I've said in, in written opinions, that the, the experts, with respect to their claims to having independently reached conclusions, are advocates. Okay? And, and that's how they're chosen, not that they give guarantees. Although one of my favorite stories comes from another bankruptcy judge who uh, had an expert on the stand and you know, cross-examiner said, what were you engaged to do? Well, I was employed to, to value this asset at X, and that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> the judge said it was the most honest response <laughs> she'd ever heard. Um, but, but look, the, the problem is, and again, I've said this publicly too, is that when the parties can't come to a consensus about what value is, uh, they, they leave the decision to, to the least expert person. Um, and as I said to the group in our planning call, I co-chaired the ABI Commission's Advisory Committee on Valuation. And when we went out to ask people, okay, what should, what should the bankruptcy code do or say, if anything else, about how we go about dealing with valuation disagreements? And uniformly, the answer was nothing. Because parties are content to be free to argue what method should be used in a given case, uh, whether something works or doesn't work, uh, and to keep their powder dry. And, and, and yet, yes, to, to leave the decision in the hands of the person, speaking for myself, generally least expert in the field, uh, but at least I'm neutral. Although the, the commission did recommend that the bankruptcy judge should have the freedom to call upon its own expert uh, to make a decision, but I've never done that. Uh, it adds another layer of expense and complexity to, to a real valuation fight, um, but I've threatened it. Would you do it? You know, in the right situation, I might. I might do it. Uh, but then you get into issues, okay, does, should the valuation expert be able to have informal communications with one party but not another, or with the court, or be subject to deposition, or cross-examination on the stand? And, and when you get into those issues, it complicates uh, things and I think reduces some of the benefit that might otherwise come from an independent view. The, the thing that strikes me is I'm, I'm always astounded at the number of times I see DCF valuations in a world where nobody ever values anything that way. Well, you no. asked the question during our planning call, yeah. why do judges use DCF? Well, judges don't suggest to the parties what methods they use. They suggest to the court which is the be best method. And that's frequently the one most recommended, along with others. Yeah, and if you're out of the money, it's great, because you can make a million weird assumptions and get any value you want, literally any value you want. And the best part is we use the projections of the failed management team to figure out what this business is going to do going forward. But I guarantee you have missed every projection they've ever made. Although I've had <laughs> experts rebuild projections okay, to support their opinion. Oh, I know. And I say, are those any better? <laughs> I get it. The, the thing is, look, in the, in the real world, we never do it that way. We're almost entirely valuing businesses on multiples and multiples that are big discounts from anything that trades in the public markets. Everyone knows exactly how it's done. You know, I, it's, it's fascinating to me that, you know, the, you'd go out and, and everyone still wants to fight over this because it strikes me as something that in the real world is done in a fairly consistent way. So, I, you know, doesn't, you know, I, you know, no investment bank has ever come in to tell me what my business is worth to sell it and put a DCF in front of my face. I think the fights come <laughs> most frequently when others in the mm -hmm. other constituents, other stakeholders say, the party that's bought at a discount is trying to extract more than its fair share of enterprise value, and therefore we're going to fight them. And we're going to fight them in this case so that they know we're going to fight them in the next one. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a dynamic that, that is real. Right Not that anyone ever stands up in court and says that. <laughs> from, a, from a practice standpoint, um, I never see a private equity get it wrong, or very rarely see them get it wrong. They're in an auction. They have figured out where they're going to be for the auction and the value, and 
very rarely do they get deal thrill or go beyond that number. And when it comes to valuing security interests in the case, they take the exact same approach. You know, later on, you have to get into the analysis in front of the judge, but very rarely do the, the folks on the front line get it wrong. So I always defer to the client because they know how to value the how to value the collateral or how to value the asset that's being sold. Maybe we can talk a little bit about um, going back to this idea of, you know, um, getting a reputation. Maybe um, among you know in court, um, Judge Carey, if there's reputation among a certain set of private equity firms, for example, or how we deal with them um, in out-of-court situations. How do we think about um, going forward, you know, how to deal with some of the creditors who might not like a certain private equity firm or judge who might have some biases maybe over different cases? How do we approach that? Or a hedge fund. Or a hedge fund, One right. One time a lawyer asked me what I thought of hedge funds in the middle of a contested case. And I said, well, if the hedge fund is involved, um, if the debtor and its allies who are pressing a plan have a flaw in the plan, they'll find it. Okay. And I can also guarantee it will take longer and cost more to get to the end. So what's the benefit and what's the cost? You know, where, where does it fall? Depends on the case. What about um, putting more money in? John, maybe you can speak to this, right? If, if we, you know, um, Brian, you had mentioned that it's not often that, at least on valuation, private, private equity gets things wrong, but at some point, you know, we have to consider how we're going to go forward. What, what things do you look for? When is what's a good candidate to put a few to put some new capital into? Um, <clears throat> look, I, I actually think in reality most of these deals are good candidates to put more money into. Once again, you know it best. You know the team. The problem is you failed with it, and so I think psychologically it's really hard to put money in. But I think you do have to figure that out up front because if what you want to do is put money in. There's a whole path you're going to go down or a whole series of things you want to do starting very, very early, um, which are going to take more time. you got to get everyone in the right places. If you don't want to put more money in, it's a whole separate issue. And then all you can really do is trade time and control for value, in which case you're much better off doing a very quick deal and just trying to get whatever value you can out of it. The, the other issue with putting money in, I find, is that traditional private equity, distressed deals work very different than a traditional private equity deal. So a traditional private equity deal, you start by focusing on value, and then you sort of go down this process and continue to, to figure out value and all the little issues in a deal. And when you get a typical private equity guy in a distressed deal, he wants to start by talking about value. In a distressed deal, you don't start with value, you start with process. You have to work all the way down a process before at the end you figure out value. And it's very disconcerting to most guys that are used to doing traditional private equity deals. And so I think that's the other thing that sort of really stands in their way of, of wanting to put new money in, is they start by saying, well, what value and how's value going to work? And that just doesn't work very well, because then everyone has their hand out and everyone wants more. And before you know it, it doesn't work. And what they need to do is talk about process. And this is the process I'm going to go down, get to the end, offer their value, and try to cut a deal. But that's entirely different from the way a normal private equity deal works. Most, pri most of the private equity folks that we represent, they have a decision tree and it's already there. And they go down and how much is it going to cost to run the process in the bankruptcy and to do the sale? And uh, how much is it going to cost to stay out of bankruptcy and do a, you know, do a gift to the creditors and, and retain our equity? And you know, they compare the two decision trees and pretty formulaic and they get there. Um, sometimes there are some intangibles, you know, about people and the, and the nature of the business, but pretty, pretty lockstep. And one of the things about putting in new money like that is the difference between in court and out of court. Out of court, you can do it with some degree of impunity. In court, there are certain tests that need to be made, North LaSalle being one of them. I don't know if you wanted to touch on that. Well, look, there's, there's a cost associated with having to go into bankruptcy or deciding it's good for the end result to have the confirmation order or the 363 sale order uh, that's so coveted. And, and so the parties have to understand it. And the law is pretty well enough settled to know what they go in, what the issues are, generally what the result is likely to be. Um, and it's, it, there's cost to it. And there's a process, OK? It's always a process. And sometimes it goes on longer than people would like. Probably judges feel the same way. Uh, but people are entitled to due process in our system. 
and when you when you decide you want a judicial resolution of a distressed business, which is what bankruptcy is, uh, you have to account for the process. And, and the costs of that process are enormous. And they aren't just the professional fees, because businesses don't get better in bankruptcy. They get worse all the time, every time. And so, you know, if you have to get down that bankruptcy road, it's going to be very, very expensive. And that's one of the big advantages that equity has, is I can make everyone go down that road if I want to. And so it's something I can trade for value if I want to do that. Or a moratorium, which buys you your time. That is, I mean, I couldn't agree more that time is your friend. And the, the longer you stretch things out, the more valuable option value is. Yep. Just one quick snippet. Um, we've been obviously very focused on uh, the bankruptcy process, because that's where we are. But I wonder if you know, Brian and Henry and John, maybe you and your colleagues, could we just beyond jump, extrapolate just for one minute and kind of think about, I don't know if you guys hear clients talking about, well, beyond the bankruptcy process, whether it's this company or my next set of companies, are there any issues that people talk about in the primary market where maybe there's additional you know, headaches to pricing a new deal based on some actions that a firm might have taken in bankruptcy with this one firm? Should we think about those things at all? I know that's not really your expertise area. But. No, but it's interesting, right? Because it is, it is critically important. I think a lot of private equity firms, you know, value their reputation very highly. And, you know, the most important thing for me actually isn't getting 10 cents on this deal. It's doing my next deal. And so you have to ask yourself how many bridges you want to burn to do that, on the other hand, there's lots of lenders out there. <laughs> and so I see other firms out there burning bridges left and right, and you know, it works for them. Um, Is it important just to keep a certain set then that you have in your back pocket? Well, the guys that burn bridges just go through them, right? Because you're gonna burn the bridges. And so you know, you're gonna have some favorite lender who does three deals for you, and then you're gonna fight like heck with them, and you go on to some new set of lenders. Um, you know, we have, we have one bank that's done almost every deal in our fund, and, and we like that, and we're good with that. But if you want to do, be in the bridge burning business, you know, you're going to go lender to lender to lender and do three deals with each of them. And um, it's a lot more work. It's a lot harder. Uh, but there's our guys that argue that's the right way to do it. Great. Well, I think we're just about out of time. Did you um, guys have any closing comments that you wanted to make at all? I just wanted to take a minute about the book. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have read the, the first book on uh, how to uh, investment banking, but I, I, I enjoyed it and have referred to it in the past. Um, for those of us who are doing the deals day in and day out, uh, the book gives you uh, some great perspective. It allows you to step back and take in what's going on in the market a little bit, and we kind of lose sight of that. So it's a, it's a good assessment of the market and the things that have changed in, in our world. And to that extent, uh, I would highly recommend the book. Great, Henry. Good, thank you. Good share. OK, anyone else at all before we close? All right, well, thank you so much, you all, for joining Great. me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.